Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about this little puppy. This is my first own bench power supply. It's been yeah, now two years since I started electronics, a bit more maybe. And it was time for me to get a bench power supply where I can adjust the voltage and the current. So I'll talk more about it. So what I had until now was this. This was my power supply. And it comprised two things, the ATX breakout board and an ATX power supply. This is a pretty standard ATX power supply you can get from any computer. And what's good is that they offer a wide range of voltages which you can get on this uh, main connector um, using this breakout board. And this breakout board does nothing else than just take the, the power levels offered by the X power supply and bind it to posts. And actually you don't need a lot more for, for electronics. You have all the voltages you need. You have ground, 3.3 volt, 5 volt, 12 volt. You even have minus 12 volt, so you could by using these two leads, you could have 24 volts. And that's quite fine. An on-off switch, LEDs to tell if everything wo works well. So for electronics, this is quite good. You have all the voltages you need. The problem is you cannot set currents. Um, here the currents are limited by these polyfuses of 1.25 um, amps. So this is the maximum, 1.25 amps. That's enough for electronics, so if you want to do other things then you have to circumvent these fuses, but you cannot set it low so to prevent short circuits or just to to test out your your device before it gets too hot or simply monitor what kind of current is, is used as with other power supplies that you will have a, a display. But um, I will still use it and I'm quite happy with it for uh, easy for simple voltages, it's a really nice device. So for the next power supply, or let's say for my first power supply, because this ATX power supply is, cannot be really considered as a real desktop laboratory power supply. So for my first power supply, I had already some criteria, And this helps a lot in selecting something because you can reject or uh, a lot of power supply, if they don't match your cr criteria, don't take the first one you just find, but use your criteria and then consider the power supplies. First, it shouldn't be too expensive. I'm doing electronics as an amateur, so I won't spend thousands of euros just for a desktop laboratory power supply. Nothing like Agilent or something, they, they just cost too much. Um, but also, I didn't want it to be too cheap because I don't want it to break just after one year of usage. So it should have some kind of some certain uh, a minimal quality. Also, that's linked to the second criteria. It shouldn't be a no-name brand because you don't know what's really inside. You don't know how long it lasts. So if you try to find if you use something which has a well-known brand you can expect some, some accuracy and some quality. Um, that's considering the price and the, the selection already. Then, considering the characteristics of the power supply, I want it to have a wide voltage range. So, for example, from 0 volt to 50 volts, because I want to try things out. I don't want it to be limited to, 50 to, to 30 volt, for example. I would like to be able to go higher in case I just need it. Also, um, a difference to the ATX, I want to be able to set the maximum current it can draw. On this ATX power supply, the limiting factor is just the fuse, and you cannot control it. It's fixed. Here, I want it to be able to set the maximum current. And then, I want it to be silent, so no loud fan. That also means that the power supply wouldn't be able to deliver a lot of power because if you deliver a lot of power, you need to dissipate dissipate some, some heat. Mm. That's why you need a, a big fan in the thing. So if I don't want any fan or if I just I want a small silent fan, then it won't be able to deliver a lot of power. 
But that's not too important. I'm just doing electronics. I'm not doing some heavy machinery. So 5 amps is completely okay. Also, and surprisingly, not all power supplies have that. I wanted it to have a ground connection on the front panel so I can tie the minus pole to ground. And you might think that all power supplies have that, but if you look closely, not all of them have this. And that was one of the criteria. The last criteria, which actually is the hardest criteria, is I wanted to be able to connect it to the computer. So I could monitor the activity or even remote control the power supply. And this is pretty hard to find on the low end market. And even on the high end market, not all power supplies can be actually controlled. Or they can just or they can be controlled over GPIV, but this is just a pain because this costs a lot of money adapter and it's a weird protocol. I wanted something easy. And I think this criteria removes a lot of candidates along with all the other ones. And this is actually the one I found. So this is the power supply I found. I bought it from eBay for around 80 euros and I think it's a fair price. It's second hand, so you don't really know the quality which uh, is inside or how well it has been used, but it's not a problem. So this is the EAPS 208403B. It has the main switch on the front chunky so that's good it's not a soft switch it's a it's a hard switch and it has the separate on off switch for for the output power and for the output power you have the two these two posts here but also i wanted to have the ground post and here's the ground post so i can tie plus or minus to ground if i want or just put some for example some strap um on it Um, so this power supply supports uh, provides 0 to 84 volts at the output. So this has a wide voltage range and exactly what I wanted. So that's that's a plus. Only 0 to 3 amperes. It's not too much, even because you have to consider it's 80 watt max. So you can ha not have 80 amperes if you use 84 volts. You can only have 1.1 ampere if you use or 1 to 2 amperes if you use 84 volts because you have to respect this 100 watts. But because you respect the 100 watts, there is no fan. It is completely fanless, so it's it's silent. That was exactly what I wanted, something really silent. You just have the air, warm air, which goes out of the holes and on the other side. And on the back. Um, so e I've never heard of EA previously, but this is Elektroautomatik GmbH, that's a German company. And as you know, German make only good products and strong products, they know what quality is. So I, I don't know how good this one is, but for the beginning, it seems to be nice. And there's also a website which has this product on it. So they still support and maintain it. Uh, here you find all the markings again, and you can see that it's even written in German. And this is the model name, PS for power supply, EA for electroautomatic, 20 because it's the 2000 series, 84 because it supports up to 84 volts on the output, 03 because it provides up to 3 amperes. You can also have 5 amperes or different voltages and B probably because it's the second revision, I don't exactly know. But yeah, perfectly what I want. And also what gives... in confidence is this CE marking. So this is the European CE marking. It's not like this Chinese CE marking. You can recognize this because the E is very close to the C. Whereas here, the E is a bit further away to the C. And if you close the circle of the C, then this is exactly where the E will begin. And this is how you recognize the C, uh, European CE marking versus the copy um, Chinese CE marking. And yeah, it also uh, it even offers a ground post, a uh, ground connection on the back. That's not too bad. The power input and even the fuse is just there. So it seems to be a pretty good quality power supply. And most importantly, it, it's an LCD, that's okay. Uh, it allows you to set the current. Perfect for a bunch power supply, a bench power supply. And what's 
most important for me was it has a USB connection so I can remotely monitor and remotely control it and that was almost the most important criteria I had so with that everything is fulfilled for 8 euros I got a new power supply try to time to test it out so let's test the power supply let's switch it on and we see we have a blue background and even backlit LCD screen with some white markings that looks nice we have the voltage and the current we have only two points after the after the two digits after the point it's not too precise but it's enough it's still a wide range power supply so you should want you probably wouldn't want to have the two digits <coughs> and then you have the current mm. showing off on the preset you can set you can preset some kind of voltage and maximum current you uh, you want to to go out this is good so you can change before you switch it on you also have uh, over voltage and over current protection so this is 84 volts plus 10 percent and here you see the current is also plus 10 percent and this is just if you want to be sure that this voltage and current doesn't uh, reach this this limits and then you have a lock which allows you to lock the settings so whenever you do long measurements and play on this around it won't change anything kind of protection so this is good let's switch it on and so what i miss is that when it switch off you cannot change the voltage or the current right here you have to go in the menu and there you can change the voltage and the current while it's off but this menu goes off after a couple of seconds if you don't change anything it doesn't stay which is also not too bad but it's, it's a design choice so let's get it off and this seems to be the voltage which is measured and not displayed so if we switch it on we switch it on this is the voltage which we did set i think so um and then we can still adjust what's what's going out what i find weird is that it doesn't count all the turns so if i turn it really fast see live turn it fast it didn't change anything it skips kind of thing that's that's already not too good but another problem is that um if i turn it slowly sometimes it doesn't even change like here one turn let's let's try here that worked here i've turned it one turn oh it, it takes time to change i can turn it one turn and here it's changed two times although i turn it only once so i don't know what's happening here i turn it once and it didn't change so i don't i find it a bit uh, a bit weird and we'll we'll have a look at it um also you have two two settings course or fine fine you just change the digit behind the first comma and course you change the voltage directly um, somehow yeah you change the voltage and then course uh, what's funny is that in fine they show you two digits afterwards but this one is completely useless I don't know if in other model it works, but this one stays always at zero, no matter what change you have. You cannot even set it, or even if it's not really what's going out here, it will always show zero. This is a bit misleading, and I don't think this is a really good thing. I mean, if you measure something, because this is what's measured on the front, this is what's set, and this is what is measured, you should at least be able to show at the second digit what you measure. Um, that's that's a big minus but we'll see on the output if if the measurements applies to to what we turn so here i've connected the power supply to my unity uh, ut61e digital multimeter with thick cables so there shouldn't be too much of a voltage drop using the cables if a bit longer that's switching to volts and as you can see already it provides one zero dot fourteen volts even if it is switched off and it it could be just the capacitors you you would think it's just the capacitors of inside which are not discharged but okay now we've discharged all the capacitors we had zero volts so the multimeter um, is has the right value and if i put it on again 
we see there are 0 0.14 volts coming out of it, even if it's switched off. What the hell is going on? This is not very good. I don't know how much current is going through. We'll probably measure that, but this is already a bad, not, not a too good sign. So let's try it to switch it on this time. We have 5 volts, uh, 0 0.15 um, amperes. So at least on the on the voltage, you can set this digit. You cannot set this digit. It will always stay zero. It's just a pain. It's completely useless. On the amperes, you can set this digit. I think probably because on the voltage, you can set from zero to 84, which is a right range. So setting the second digit doesn't make sense, but then don't show it. And on the amps, you see zero to, zero to three amps, so it makes more sense to be able to set the second digit. But yeah, if you... Um, and what's even worth is that um, this is what is measured. So what is measured, you could, even if you shouldn't be able to set the second digit, when you measure it, you should be able to, to show it. And what is measured is completely different here. Here it measures 0 volts. Here it measures 0 .14, uh, 14 volts. And if we switch it on to 5 volts now, now that it's 5 volts, Okay, 5.02 are coming out. You see the measurement? 4.70, there's something completely going very wrong with the measurements. And what's funny is that this, even if it measures um, 5.7 volts, it still provides, uh, 4.7 volts, it still provides 5 volts, as I've, as I've asked it. So the reading which is here is not used to change what is on the back and so we had here we in the beginning we had 0 0.14 volts and here it was showing zero so you can think that well what's going out here matches zero volts so there's no change and this is why it's 0 0.14 but what is measured here is not used so even if it shows zero this is not what is driving this post here so the 0 0.14 volt which is going out uh due to something else, not to the measurement, because this measurement is wrong. And if I, But what's funny is if I turn one click, oh, it goes up. Here we can see it goes up again. The measurements are wrong. And sometimes here, I've just turned once and it turned two digits. Now I've turned one turn and here you saw that it went 0 0.10 volts up, but here it didn't. So, um, now it does, okay, uh, it does uh, take quite some time, even if it's pretty stable. So you can see here that the voltage are uh, taken into account when I step one, you don't see it changing here all the time, but it does really change. But still, if I go fast, it doesn't change. Oh, it does change quite fast too. So it's just this screen, which is, or this measurement, which is not really good. And what's funny is when I switch it off, you see it goes down slowly. You see it on the multimeter also. It ramps down very slowly. So the capacitors are bleeding away through with this, so probably. But it takes forever to go down. It doesn't go to, to zero volt immediately. I'm not sure if this is if this is really good. So let's see how much power is going out when it is on the off. Uh, off state where no power should be going out but we've measured the voltage so I'll connect to the micro amp port um, now first I'll change to the micro amp port first always change the right setting and then plug it in and we can see that it provides 0 0.1 milliampere when it is off I think that shouldn't be the case, but uh, yeah, it does provide 0 0.1 milliampere what it is off. It's not not very good. So let's see how how much deviation there is between the voltage it says going out, the voltage it measures, and the raw voltage which is really going out. So we'll switch it on. As you can see at the beginning, it says zero volt, but there is already some voltage. If we crank it up, we see there is some difference. For example, on one volt, there is 0 0.35 volts difference. If we go 
higher up. Let me go to course. For example, on 30 volt. Oh. Yeah, something around 30 volts. There is the difference is quite less. So it says 29.8 and here it's 29.74. So already when we go higher, the difference uh, goes decreases. And if we go up to the 84 volts, uh, it's not coarse anymore. Why is it not coarse anymore? Does it defaults back? So here, 84 we see we are 84.1, we see 84.15. So now it's a bit it's a bit, bit higher, but the difference between what is measured um, on Belgium multimeter and what is measured here is a lot less at 84 volts than in the beginning. And to figure out how the difference changes with the voltage, you could do it by hand, like changing here, waiting, noting down what's, what's said here, showing what is said here, because actually it should output um, 82.40 volts. This is what is set. Uh, this is what it measured, 82.60, and this is what it really outputs, given that this multimeter is calibrated the right way. But I mean, by this precision, I think it's the, the measurement which is coming out of this multimeter is good enough compared to what is here, because we've seen that this one has already issues between what is set and what is measured. So yeah, you could go by hand and note all the three values and then increase 0 to 1 volts, but this is really tedious to do it all the time. But this is also why I bought a power supply with an external monitor remote control. So I can, can connect over USB this power supply, control it, have it change every 0 0.1 uh, volt because this is the minimal change you can make. Um, see the difference between what I set, what this one measures, and what goes out of here because this multimeter I also bought it because here it has an infrared output and I think even you could see it blinking. Yeah, you can see this one blinking. So the values uh, is actually sent over here and I can connect this multimeter to my computer so I could read what is, I could set the voltage, read what it measures, what the power supply measures and read what the multimeter measures using the computer and have this automated and that will be the next step. So let's find out more about this product. It's the EAPS 2084-03B, as you might know, and you can still buy it, actually. It's still sold, so it doesn't seem to be a too old model. You can find it on Fanel for around 200 euros or a bit more, but um, you can still buy it. I got mine from eBay secondhand for 80 euros, so I think it's a, it's a fair price. Um, here is the website of Electroautomatic the designer and producer of the thing and they seem to to provide power supplies for huge laboratories or huge tests and yeah they have a website with all the products so that gives a bit of confidence also they have details about the product themselves so it's just one of the products you have tons of them um, here, this is for the whole family, the PS2000 family, and yeah, PS2000 family, and then we have the 208403B with all the data sheets. So you have data sheets, you can download them, and you can see how precise and accurate this device is. What's funny is that even on the English website, you get all the names in German. So it seems to be a very German product. Um, it even comes with a software because I was interested to remotely control it to have USB and they even provide a software called Easy PS2000. What's funny is that in the test software you can only read the device information and uh, update your firmware and you have to pay a bit of money if you want to completely remote control it or log data or things like that. But this is not unusual generally if, if you want to use a software you often have to to pay more for it but they give you the test version 
just to at least test it that it works. The problem with that is it's Windows and I don't have any Windows to use this software and also not really interested to pay a huge license fee just to to get the data out. Luckily I didn't buy it before I've checked it. They provide you but only on the German website not on the English website with the Programmiereinleitung. So this is the programming manual for this device and in the programming manual here programming manual in German and in English it tells you how you talk over USB to this device and actually it's just serial over USB it's not a uh, huge complicated USB um, so let's quickly go through it serial here communication protocol so let's go down it tells you about the him he it this is useful. It does tell you that it uses a COM port. So it's we're using a serial, a normal program talking over serial who can control it. That makes it a lot easier than having to develop the program which talks USB. Um, you can install the drivers um, as you wish. I don't have Windows. I don't need to install the drivers. It's directly recognized as USB serial port. And here is the communication. So we have 118 115 200 bits per second one odd parity bit and one stop bit what's funny is that here they give this boat rate but i've actually looked at how this software works the software uses a different boat rate it uses half of this speed so yeah it's kind of a fail to provide the manual and in their own software use the the wrong boat rate but it's not really the wrong board trade and it's not really too important because it's just a virtual COM port. So it doesn't matter which board rate you're using, the both sides will know which it, which one it is and will use, so it will not break anything. But still, it's kind of a fail to not implement it the right way how to define it. And this is the protocol. Um, it's a bit weird protocol and I've I haven't really see it something like this, but at least it's defined and you can you can implement it. So pretty simple. By zero is the bit mask, the start delimiter telling which direction and so on. By byte one tells which units you want to control. Uh, the N for device node. If you have several outputs, for example, you can control which output you want to to switch on and off or control. Here I only have one output. Byte 2 is the object, what kind of query you want to send. Then you have data, for example, for sending the voltage you want to set, reading out the voltages, or for just getting the version, for example, of the device. And then you have uh, checksum, the two last bytes. Um, what's funny and what I think really is weird is that this, the data of this, the length of this data is variable. And in the first byte, the last four bits will tell you the length, but it will tell you the length minus one. So whatever you get at the four last bits, you have to increment by one to have the length of this data field. And uh, I think this is a bit weird to have a uh, data minus one length. First is weird to understand what it is, but yeah. This way it allows them to send data from 1 to 16 bytes at least, but not 0 bytes because you still have to, to add 1. Um, yeah, so simple protocol, send data, get data. So this is the protocol telegram structure as they call it. Uh, they describe which um, this start delimiter device node object is described in this manual. The data, uh, the object is actually in another manual and in another part. So here it tells you, we have more example. Here it tells you that if you want to have the object list, you go to a different file, which is this. Actually, I don't have it here. Um, what's fun? Yeah, that's different. So it tells you to look at this file. And what's fun <coughs> is that in the German version, which is here, 
if we go at the end they provide you the object list uh, somehow it goes lost in translation and even if this is German and English they didn't put the object file but in the English version they tell you to use the separate file and there is a separate file and the separate file is only this table here um, the other fail there is is when I implement it so yeah because uh, I have the data itself the programming data I've implemented it and while implementing you get errors and here there is also a second difference between the German and the English version in the German version they tell you that the object for errors is 0xff so the object numbers here you have a table for the object numbers this is the object number in decimal you don't see any ff or 255 to tell this is the error and there is a special so this is first can again of a fail but in the in this programming manual they tell you that there will be an acknowledge an acknowledgement of if there is an error it will send it will use the object ff this information is only in the german part not in the english part that cost me quite some minutes um, but here are the different things um, here are the things so if you use class version 0 you can only read the value it sends you a string with a fixed length of 16 bytes and it will tell you which kind of um, device it is and you can go through the, through the list so I've yeah I've particularly looked at that the protocol uh, it's a custom protocol but at least it's documented and it's easy to implement so I've implemented myself and we will test it immediately so I've implemented the protocol in a small script which I will show you on this laptop on the right but first we have to connect to the USB port and here is the next fail as you can see here there is a small indent for the port and the problem is that your normal mini USB connector is too thick it doesn't fit in oh, if you fit it this way it doesn't go fully in and it doesn't connect because you have some kind of plastic here and you have the indent here so they should really put uh, the USB port a bit more forward and don't have the indent else you cannot connect lots of cable of them probably there are some few cables I didn't find any so I really had to cut a cable uh, the corners of a cable to be able to fit it in there and hop. now it does fit perfectly and I can stand my start my demo program which will read out information from the device set it to 42 volts and then just track it so here you can see it read out information from the device it set it for 42 volts as you can see here the reading is wrong but it's been set to 42 volts and after 10 seconds it removes it switches off the power you can see the power goes down because the um, it is discharging it doesn't go down immediately that's also something I don't really like but I mean I accept it you can discharge it pretty fast and here you can see I track whatever's going on so if I set the voltage here you can see the voltage is increasing this is the measured value and this is the set value so this is the measured value which you see here this is the set value and if I switch it on up here you will see this is now the measured value which we see here there is a slight difference between actually this digit isn't shown it will always stay as zero the machine measures better than just the first digit after the thing this is why I can show uh, more values afterwards and this is a lot more precise than than this and we have a maximum of 40 to 42 uh, 92 volts so I can really control this device from here and monitor what's happening or the other way around I can control the device from the computer couple of notes if you want to program it yourself because there are some bugs oh now I've just disconnected the cable uh, it's not too important this this is the sheet where all the objects are defined um, there are some bugs in there let me zoom so you can see better 
there are some bugs in there. First, what is weird is how you get the values. There are several ways you get the values. Here you can use this object to get the nominal voltage, nominal current, nominal power, and then it sends a float, and this float is encoded using the IEEE 754 standard, as, as defined here. And then there's another way to set and read the value, which is defined he uh, no, here. Here, where you set integer, and actually the integer you sent is a two byte integer, and it's the per this is weird. Th it's the percentage of the nominal here, the percentage of the nominal value times two hundred fifty six times one one dot one. This is not actually times one dot one times 1.1 .1 of this is the maximum. The, how you send the data, you should refer, and also it's pretty hard to understand what they mean with here. You should look at the programming manual and here there are some examples of the actual value and the set value. The nominal value uh, percent the actual value divided by this. And you should implement it as it's defined here, actual value and set value. Um, again, you don't send the value the percentage of 1.1, .1, this the maximum is 1.1, .1, so you can go up to 92.4 volts. Uh, that's the second detail, and uh, third detail is that, as we've seen, um, there are some error or some acknowledgements. Um, what is written here is not always true. So the error with the FF message, which you get as object, only applies if you send some bogus value and it, it doesn't like it. If you send some other bogus command, it may happen that actually it doesn't use object ff, but it uses object zero, so the string. And then the first byte of object zero is ff instead of the string itself, and the rest is the code, which is here. So yeah, the first byte will be the first byte of the data value will be ff, although it should be the object, and the second one is uh, the error code itself. And no, this is not because I'm missing one byte, because the checksum is right. So it's a bug in the firmware. So what I like with this multimeter, the Unity UT61E, is that <coughs> even for its price, for its low price, it already comes with a data interface. I also have another Fluke, a multimeter, and the Fluke doesn't come with uh, with the data connection, so you have not even expensive multimeters come with it. And this one is a pretty cheap multimeter, but not a bad multimeter, it's just cheap. Um, it also has a 22,000 counts TDM, and this precision will be quite nice for, for testing it. If it's accurate or not has been tested and apparently the, what they specify is 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 really accepted. For, so for electronics this multimeter is quite nice. And when you buy it, not only it has the data port, but it comes with the cable. So the data is sent by toggling an infrared LED and this infrared LED is catched by this infrared transistor and then the data is sent to this to this COM port. So this is a DE9 connector and it talks to RS-232 protocol and you can connect it to your computer. The problem is now that um, old uh, new machines don't come with this huge COM port. Um, so you need an adapter to read it such as this one. This is a RS-232 port, DB, DE9 connector to USB. So you just connect this way to it, and then you can finally read the values from the multimeter to the USB. The problem with that is that the cheap ones have an issue. This data, this multimeter sends with the data format seven bits, one odd parity bit, and one stop bit. And the problem is that this is a bit unusual. Normally, everyone sends with eight data bits and not seven data bits. And the drivers for Linux for this cable is not uh, does not support this format yet. This cable at least uses um, CH340 or 341 chip. That's the cheapest you can have. And the driver on Linux don't support this 701 format. There is a patch for it 
which I've tried, but um, the, the data coming out is garbage. It's not the right values. On Windows, it works. On Linux, it doesn't work. I also have another cable with another older chip, which is less known. And again, I don't get data out because of this weird data, unusual data format. It's not weird. It's just an unusual data format. There are cables which works on the Linux, uh, but you have to they have to be based on the FTDI chip. And they're pretty expensive first, so I don't like them. And also, it comes from FTDI, and as we know, FTDI is not the um, is not a nice company. But RS two thirty two is very similar to UART. So what I did is I just modified the cable, and I've used a UART to USB converter. This converter is based on the Scilab CP twenty one hundred two chip. And you get this converter for around two dollars. And I've added some components here because the R232 signal is between minus 12 volt and plus 12 volts. Um, but that's not the issue because I provide five volts, so I can have it between zero and five volts. The issue is that the signal is inverted. On RS232, it idles high. So at five volts, it's idling. And then if you want to transmit data, you go on low volts. On RS-232, that's the inverse. So to convert between RS-232 format and UART format, I need to implement, I need to add an uh, inverter. And this is what this NPN transistor does. It just inverts the signal. And with that, I now finally have a USB cable for this monitor, but there is also where is it? Did I lose it? Here. There's also this cable. There's also this cable. Um, so this is called the UT02 um, cable. This is the UT04 cable, which comes with this a bit longer. And this comes directly with USB. It doesn't emulate uh, a COM port. It emulates a human interface device like... Um, like mouse, like a mouse or like a keyboard, but it fixed also perfectly well. And now we will work with this one. And to read the data out, I use again on Linux, the program called Sigrock. Um, let's sh shift to the computer. Let's connect the device. Let's switch it on. Let's start Sigrock. And as you can see, you read the values about twice to three times a second. And if you modify it, you see the values are modified. And this way I can read the values from the multimeter to the computer. So now I can connect the, I can do some tests using the power supply, the multimeter, and trace out how precise the voltage and the amps are on this multimeter. That's the next step. So here's our first test. We have the power supply, the multimeter, and the computer. The computer is control controlling the power supply over USB. Um, and it will read the data out from the multimeter over this, over this other USB. So what we'll do is we will start from zero volt. We go up to 84 volts, and we will measure the voltage which is coming out of the power supply with this multimeter, which is directly connected there. So there is no load at all for now. And we increment by values of 0 0.1 volts. And every time we wait for three seconds until it settles down. And then we make the we read the measurement from the multimeter. And we will start right now. Here you can see it reads the information from the multimeter. It sets to 0 and it waits until 0 is stable. Because sometimes, as you've seen, uh, going to 0 is not immediate. It has to discharge the capacitor. And now it started. We started with zero volts and it should increase every time 0 0.1 volt and so on. It's not perfect because it's a percentage again you cannot set exactly 0 0.1 volt but you, here you can see it increments 0 0.1 volt all the time and it logs the data from here and the data should be somewhere around here and we'll plot it afterwards but for now we will leave it go high and we will see what the data say. So First test finished, now let's go to the next test. We did the first test without any load, now we will use a load. Here I have a resistor wire, which can handle up to 
300 volts it's been used to heat up water slowly and this resistor has resistance around let's measure it Six hundred seventy-eight. Yeah, let's say six hundred seventy-eight uh, ohms. We'll just connect it to the power supply, and we will start the exact same thing, going from zero to eighty-four volts, and measuring the voltage with a small load, and we'll measure also the current through the small load. So here we are on the milliamps and you already see that at um, zero volts with the power switch off, we already have 0 0.066 milliamps. Uh, that's the bag we've seen before and this is also why we can read a uh, voltage. The voltage is a bit lower because to, to measure the milliamps, you go uh, through a, s oh, here, because we already have a resistor. That's why the voltage is not at 0 0.14 volts anymore because we have a small load. So let's start it and here we can see it starts. Now let's wait until it's finished. And now the last test will put it under some heavier load. So here we have a power resistor of 9 watts, 10 ohms. So yeah, I'll put it up to 10 watts, meaning 1 amp on there because it's a 10, 10 ohm thing and to cool it off because this will get warm I will not use a fan but I'll just put it in the water just one lead in the water and I hope that the material is not porous enough so it creates a short but we'll see it when we start and let's start so now we've did some tests and measurements over the voltage but while we're at it why not do it for the current itself so I'll do the almost same thing this time uh, it's not no load, I will just create a short directly, here you can see there's the short and I will measure the amps, we'll go here from 0 to 3 amps at the 0 0.1 amps increment at 10 volts, so it will be able to, dis it should be able to dissipate uh, to 30 watts and because there is no active cooling at all, we'll see how well it copes with the 30 watts of cooling um, so let's start directly and now we will do another test to test how our current, the current setting is. So we'll go in constant current mode. I will set it to 84 volts, the max. It will not reach it, but we will put everything through a um, power resistor. This is a 10 ohm power resistor, the same, which we will cool with water. And we will go from 0 to 1 amp. So it will draw at max 10 volts going through this 9 watts power resistor, but it will sustain 10 watts. There's the glass of water trying to cool it. I think that's not an issue. Let's start. So while we are measuring the performances of this oscilloscope, we can also measure the ripple it has. So here we have the oscilloscope set up with the channel one, the yellow channel, which will probe the power supply. We are use AC coupling for for ripple measurements with a bandwidth limitation of 20 megahertz because the ripple will always depends on the bandwidth you have and on the frequencies and here we can see that one division is 20 millivolts and if we start the power supply so preset set it to 5 volts at 0 to 2 amps switch it on put it on and here we can see the ripples this is the noise from the power supply and it's quite noisy uh, measure statistics of on so this results the statistics and we have a volt peak to peak of 130 millivolts constantly at around 130 millivolts but if we look at the data sheets um, we see that the ripple for high frequencies with a bandwidth limit of 20 megahertz should be less than 60 millivolts peak to peak this is not the case here we almost double all the time but it's only in bursts. It's not always, it's not completely on, it's all, always in bursts. So probably it's when it's recharging and discharging the capacitors. But yeah, this ripple isn't 
isn't actual anymore. It's not respected. That's bad. Sad. So here we have the files which I just recorded. We have the three different voltage measurements with the different loads, 10 ohm loads, 680 ohm loads and no load at all. We have the two current measurements uh, and they are all saved in its comma separated vertices, vertices um, data. I'll put the, the files on the wiki and the, the code to run the tests in the git. And normally I do plot this kind of long values using new plots and this time I was just lazy so I just used LibreOffice and the integrated, um, the integrated graph capability just out of convenience but in the end I didn't save any time because you have five different sheets and for all sheets you have to make the graph so that took a bit of time and in thinking with group plot it would be almost as fast but at least you have one file and everyone can look at this file and here the data so here we have the five different um, the five different experiments um, which I've just also titled here here we have in the beginning the experimental values so this is for the power supply voltage accuracy without any load um, everything is in volts because it's voltage accuracy here you see this, the value which I've set on the machine. This is the value which the power supply measured itself compared to what it set. This is the value which the multimeter measured to compared to what is set. And in the beginning to see what the difference is, I just um, created this thing. So this is actually the value difference between the actual value and the set value. So the actual value is what the, the power supply measured itself. And this is the difference between the measured value and the set value. We can see the results here. Going from 0 volt to 84 volts and the seesaw, I'm not sure what the reason is about. Probably maybe it's because of the multimeter, the way it measures. Sometimes it overshoots, sometimes it undershoots and this is uh, after it spits, I'm not sure about it, or maybe it's the power supply, but you could take the average out of it. The red is the value, which is measured by the multimeter, and the blue it's line are the values measured by the power supply itself. And as you can see, for the voltage between 0 and 84 volts, we always overshoot. So what is measured in the beginning is 0 0.1 volts higher than what I've set. And it changes a bit over time, but not too much. Surprisingly, what the power supply measures itself to compare to what is said, this is completely different. In the beginning, it just undershoots completely, M minus 0 to 3 volts, what if measured to compare to what if set. And this corrects over time, but this is still huge. The important part here is the difference between what the the thing which I see on the power supply is, so the actual data and the measure data. So in the beginning we have minus 0 0.4 volts difference between what is displayed on the power supply and what is really output by the power supply. And that's quite a lot. And then it changes over time and it gets less and less. So what is important, what, what you generally see specified is the accuracy. This is the second colon which you see here. So the accuracy is just the difference divided by the set value. And since it really gets close and the value is always bigger when you, and the value gets bigger, then the difference gets smaller. So the accuracy gets even smaller. And this is what you see here. In the beginning, we have this huge spike where there's a hundred percent inaccuracy and then it just converges. So after 10 volts it's pretty precise, before 10 volts it's not really precise and particularly below 1 volt completely unprecise. This undershoots, this overshoots. And the accuracy is what you see in the data sheet. So if we look at the data sheet, this is the data sheet from the EA product catalog 2012, we have the PS 208403 and you see here that the accuracy for the voltage should be 
less or equal to 0.2%. If we look at these values, this is not the case at all. This is not less or equal to 0.2%. Here we have a difference of 50% and the difference actually should be between what the actual value is and you well it doesn't here it doesn't even say if it's the difference between what is output or what is measured and what is really output what is set and what is output or what is measured by the thing itself and what is output <clears throat> so this is completely offset but whenever you see a percent there is some kind of relationship to something here i've told you that the percent is compared to the set value um, here there are no details but the devil is in the details and if you look at the uh, instruction manual compared to the product catalog we have here again a product ps 2084 b 03b here we have the accuracy zero to the less or equal to zero to two percent but here we have a small star and this small star on the top will give you so this is related to the nominal value um, and the nominal value is the maximum value. The maximum value here is 84, per, is 84 volts for the thing. So the accuracy should always be less or equal than 0 to 2% of 84 volts and that's around 160 millivolts. Yeah, around 160 millivolts, 170 even if you round it. And as we can see here, this is the last graph where I've really set the accuracy compared to the 84 volts and it should always be below this line, um, plus or minus. So we see in the, here, and we see that what is measured, it's completely off. It's not between, uh, it's not below than 0 0.20%. But this is only what is measured by the by the power supply itself, if we look at what is output by the power supply, then this is actually true. It is between zero and 20%. It's just the measurement which is completely off scale. It changes over time, but I mean, that's, that's normal. It cannot be the same all the time. So the output is pretty okay, at least with no load. If we look at exactly the same data with um, this, the high voltage, a uh, high ohm load, the resistor, we have 680, 678 ohms. Here we see again, this is the important part. Here we see it undershoots in the beginning and until 20 volt, it doesn't respect this minus less or equal than 0.2%. But then it does respect, it overshoots even a bit in the beginning. But the actual thing, which is output by the device, this respects completely from beginning on. It It is under 0.2%. 20%. So it's just the voltage measurement which is completely off. And if we look also at the data with the 10 ohm load, we can even see in more details the seesaw pattern because um, I think it's also due to the power supply more than the multimeter because the multimeter has a finer step. It has 22,000 counts. So the multimeter does that. Uh, the, the power supply does, does this pattern. And here you can see more details because we only went up to 11 volts. And again, you can see that it almost never respects with a high load. It almost never respects this accuracy of minus 0 to 10%. And this is compared to 84 volts, which is quite high. So having a difference of 170 millivolts is already, I think, is it's pretty high, but I mean, it's a high range power supply, so that's okay. And if we look at what is output, it always almost respects. And for an old unit, second hand, you don't know what's happened before, I think it's pretty okay. It's always overshoots a bit. It's always between minus 10, uh, plus 0 0.10% and 0 0.20%, but that's okay. Now, if you look at the current, the current is the same thing. If you look at the current, the accuracy minus 0 0.2% of the nominal, and the nominal for us is 3, um, three, um, 3 amps. And if we look at the current, 
again the accuracy here we can see that in the beginning it doesn't respect it but afterwards but the difference is not that high it's just minus 0 at 40 percent then it just crosses there and it never reaches zero uh, in the beginning it, it always undershoots and in the beginning it overshoots the current uh, what is measured but not long ago after 0 0.25 volts you can see that no 0 0.25 amp amps you can see that you are always lower so what is measured and what is really output is lower than what is set but um, Again, if we look at the at the accuracy, it respects the accuracy. At least at what is output, what is measured is completely off. And same thing with the 10 ohm load. Here it overshoots and in, in the beginning at one or two it undershoots and it's always within this minus zero to 20 percent. So that is okay. And we can see this, I think regulating steps or maybe this is because due to the ADC and the feedback which is in the power supply, this kind of steps and this kind of, of peaks which you see here. And by the way, here you can see that it's um here you can see that it's it, it, it converges because the higher you go the uh, this is the accuracy to the value which is set, the higher the value is, so the smaller the difference gets. But this table looks exactly like this table because this is the voltage and this is just divided by uh, 3 amps. So this is why they look exactly similar. It's just the scale which is different. So there's definitely something wrong with the internal, um, internal measurement units which is just used for the display. It's not the measurement unit which is used for the output. This is still pretty much okay. So don't rely on what is the measurement which are displayed on the power supply, but rely on what you set. It is within the accuracy. That's good. But there is one thing which still didn't do with this power supply to see if it's uh, good or not, is look at what's inside and at the guts to see if it's good quality and how it's made. So let's not wait anymore let's do it immediately and i already taken the screws out and as you can see they come even with washers so that's nice and nice and attention to details um, you have one screw here and then four screws on the bottom these ones here also you see that some of the screws have a nice cap on it again nice attention to details let's open the device oh stuck oh full metal and here we are here we have the device and already looking at that it looks pretty nice so if we have a look at the input we see that we have thick cables 18 avg they are tied correctly they have the right connectors on the two sides the ground though is directly soldered uh, it, it doesn't have this this connector, this crimp connector, but that's I think that's okay. They do it from for the main ones. Um, if we look at the output, we have also very beefy cables. On one side, they are soldered and put some glue on there or elastic to keep it. to keep it tight and here we have the output and directly on the output we have two capacitors and this is ground which is connected directly to this to the chassis using some kind of weird thing I'm not sure if this is the best I've seen you soldering immediately here and then to the to the chassis I would have preferred a cable but that's okay but even looking at the just the component itself, it's quite, the layout is quite proper. Um, you have space between all the components. Here we have three huge capacitors. These are, what's the brand? KXG, oh, they're not too bad. Um, the component well layout, um, if we have surface, we have difference between surface mount capacity surface mount devices here and then through hole devices 
and you can see the through hole devices we have lots of through hole resistors but they are really thick through hole resistors they have a huge clearance here let me zoom a bit so you can see more they have a huge clearance everywhere we have beefy devices here also beefy devices we can handle a lot of power and they all are standing with some relief in there so any vibration should be kept by this relief so this is quite nice we have the two main transformers and we have two heat sinks what's funny is this screw which we see just holds these plates so we could even remove these plates to have even more airflow going in i don't know where they left it maybe on other devices with fans they they, they remove it the case seems to be universal to all of them and in the input we also see lots of capacitors with the two huge strokes everything behind the shield maybe it prevents also for an em shielding also for cooling probably um, in the input we already saw we have a fuse in here but actually there's an additional fuse right there with the input protection you would wait for the input so this is really impressive also here on the heatsink this transistor here this is the diode bridge rectifier or oh, i'm not sure if it's diode bridge rectifier just bridge rectifier here we can see we have the the silicon pad which is separating this transistor and this transistor is holds in place and pressed against the heatsink using this clip and only this clip is connected here so you, you have no screw on the tab no matter what the tab is that is nice and you see the same efforts here here we have again the silicon pad let me get remove this grease here the silicon pad with so these three beefy transistors with lots of via stitching and lots of ground plane can directly go to this heat sink which we see here and they are not connected directly the, the heat sink is and the pcb is hold with these screws and as you can see these screws don't connect to any other power thing here they connect on it connects only to ground and if we look at the back if the heat sink which is folded meaning that the heat even goes to the external case so it can go here and to the external case so lots of attention to details and it's pretty well pretty good engineered here we have some i don't know what this does but it looks fancy and it looks well made good quality apparently but i'm not an expert they're just doing amateur electronics i have no idea how it works inside just looking at the components and even here we have so we have two boards this is the lcd board and this is i don't know any other kind of board probably to do the measurements this is all digital this is probably all analog not sure this is the digital part with the connector here directly soldered on it looks good quality too here we have i'm not sure if it's a programming header or if it's just a calibration header because here we have a second header with a one millimeter pitch this might be the programming header and this might be the header used for calibration it has a small other header probably for the clock not sure what it is for and this component here is this is an lpc 1313 f so it's an i'm sure it's an arm microcontroller with some nice ribbon cable and adc connector idc connector going to the front panel so i will take the front panel out to see if we can see more about the front panel here we already see we have also some kind of programming or some kind of interface um but yeah it looks good i'm impressed it looks well made made in germany nothing less to expect from that so i'm really happy with it and you see no fan at all it is completely silent and well made 
and thank you for the other model you can even add additional capacitors here is one here is one here is one but we've seen there are enough capacitors already even these ones which are cleaning it on the thing so let's get the front panel going so i've dismounted the front panel and yeah this screw here is a pain so everything is well designed except this part here this is not well made and it, the, the screw was a bit hard to get uh, and it's the only screw with a nut so although no, it's not the only screw with a nut there and it's here even more but yeah this one this one was not too hard either but this is the front panel and this looks also nice they even had holes here to have this lcd board connected and screwed directly on here so really nice touch so we see we have two models two models two parts the main board with you see the esd logo in silk screen and on the back with esd logo and the copper marking what's funny also is they use two kinds of ground planes they didn't ground everything and here they have the hashed ground plane and here they have the full ground plane not sure why they use different ones but here we have thick traces going a bit everywhere here thick traces here again very thick traces so very well made on and on the front you have here dedicated power supply with an 78L33 for 3.3 volt for this microcontroller the two buttons preset on off the two rotary encoders the USB which is mounted vertically here we have the 12 megahertz clock and this is yet another microcontroller it's an let me check LPC 134034 NXP again an ARM microcontroller so it's a bit beefy two ARM microcontrollers just for this but they spared no cost and here we have again this um, 2x5 so 10 pins I think this is for debugging this is probably yeah sort for debugging and the other one which is which we saw here is for programming and this one is just probably JTAG or something else we also had a connector here but we have markings in there we have high reset 3 to 3 volts something enable debug or boot enable and digital ground it's not only ground it's digital ground fancy um i don't think the adc which is used to do the measurement is on here i didn't see any external parts doing the adc here there is just a uh, driver buffer probably this is for the screen i'm not sure maybe the adc is on here i have to check but yeah nice little board pretty well made the traces and clearances are quite respected there are some holes a bit everywhere for the design and even if you look at the soldering the soldering is quite well made no flux remainings anywhere i'm impressed here oh <laughs> they didn't solder these two pins so at least these two pins are not used here they used four pins two times two pins probably for ground and three volt or five volt i don't really know but that's fun and this is probably the communication with the board for the communication with the board um yeah let's see if i can mount everything back again and if it works so i've mounted it back on and actually i have to say that this screw was a pain to remove in the beginning but to put it back was even more a pain i had to desolder this joint to be able to place the step again and then resolder it that's but that's the only thing which which was bad um, else everything is pretty well designed the screws fit fit well the design is as well and we will test if it's working so except this one screw it, it 
because the pain everything worked nice so let's switch it on oh zero ps2000 yeah it seems to work perfect the other problem i saw is that look at all the components Some digital components. Here there is this board with the two resistors and the two pins. I don't know what exactly it does, but you see something is missing. There is no trim pots or trim condenser uh, capacitor anywhere. You cannot tweak anything. I've also looked in the manual, and in the manual it doesn't tell you how to calibrate it. It's cannot calibrate it at all, at least by yourself. So I've contacted EA, Electro Automatic, to ask them how to calibrate it. And that said, yeah, we can calibrate it for you. No issue. Just send it to us. And if it's under warranty, we'll recalibrate it. The problem is this is second hand. I don't know if it's under warranty. And from this point on, they just stopped any contact. Uh, I've asked how to recalibrate it myself because I wrote the software. Um, they didn't answer at all. I even told them, yeah, I found some a couple of bugs because I implemented uh, the protocol myself. Uh, would you like to roll them? No replies at all. So good for the first reply in the beginning, but afterwards, now nah, the contact went bad. That's a bit sad. And the problem is that, yeah, I like this unit actually. Well designed, um, huge range, it accomplishes all the characteristics I really wanted. I can program it myself, the interface wasn't too complicated. The only issue is that the voltage reading is completely off. Um, and I cannot calibrate it myself. I don't know how to do that and it's not documented. I even probed for all the objects, so I asked using the own program for all the objects. I found some ob objects which are undocumented, some commands which are undocumented uh, in the in the manual. So I think using these commands they are able to to set something or to remove something, but since they are documented I cannot tell. So a bit sad that they didn't reply with how to recalibrate it or even I've looked there is no firmware for that the not at all so I cannot update it the firmware I have is the only one I will have I don't know how to recalibrate it I'm not sure if it's through here or probably it's even through the USB using the hidden commands which I found but all in all just don't look at the voltage reading it's completely off but you can still use the, the voltage which you set is is pretty much fine so just use the voltage setting have your own multimeter if you want next to it the current reading works and the voltage well it's only important what you set and if you're in constant current or constant voltage mode um, and yeah with that i'm pretty happy with this power supply so enjoy <laughs>